I'll introduce myself at this point. I'll be your moderator today. I'm Tom Murphy, General Manager and Editorial Director for Simpler Media Group, publishers of CMS Wire. Customer success is one of the primary areas I cover, and I've re recently interviewed several of the CEOs of the leading companies in the space. I also cover customer experience, CMS, digital marketing, collaboration, analytics, and more. I'm also the author of Web Rules, How the Internet is Changing the Way Consumers Make Choices. Today's program is sponsored by Demandbase, which is the only marketing solution designed specifically for account-based needs of B2B. Check out their offerings at demandbase.com. Now it's time to introduce our two main speakers today. Holger Schulz is VP of Marketing for EG Innovation and author of the 2014 B2B Marketing Analytics Report that we're going to be speaking about today. He's a prolific blogger and online community builder, something that I have in common with Holger. We'll have to talk about that offline sometime. He manages the B2B technology marketing community on LinkedIn, connecting over 60,000 members. Proud to say I'm one of them. Our second guest is Amit Varsnaya, VP Consulting and Strategic Services at Demandbase. Amit won the Marquee or Marketing Visionary at the Eloqua Experience 2010. He's the former global head of marketing at Hexaware Technologies. Without further ado, I think it's time to turn the microphone over to Holger. If you take, the, take that mic and go with it, Holger, we'll get underway. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. And uh, hello, everybody. The uh, marketing analytics survey that we conducted earlier this year you know, revealed some really interesting uh, trends that I'd like to share with you over the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, just some uh, background, this marketing analytics report is based on you know, a comprehensive survey that we sent to the members of the LinkedIn group, um, the B2B technology marketing community, basically um, to explore the state of marketing analytics in 2014. And we received a lot of responses, over 500 marketing professionals uh, you know, responded to the survey. And basically we distilled the survey findings into an information-rich report to provide marketers with uh, valuable benchmarks for their own marketing planning and uh, also to provide you know, actionable insights into key trends, challenges, and best practices for marketing analytics. Now let's uh, take a closer look. The key benefits marketers expect from marketing analytics are you know, all about better understanding what tactics, channels, and platforms truly uh, you know, deliver ROI, and based on that insight, being able to prioritize tactics. So gaining actionable insights from marketing analytics is by far the most important business objective, and we will dive deeper into this topic later in the webinar. And of course, uh, there are challenges, right, on the path to gaining actionable insights from data, and the most mentioned challenge um, is or are, you know, lack of system integration, data quality, and lack of resources. More on that uh, later in the presentation. At the same time, marketing analytics budgets are expected to grow, so there is some help on the way to overcome those challenges, you know, be it in the form of more resources or better tools that, uh, you know, to make sense of all the data. Now, before we drill down a bit further, uh, let's have a quick audience poll. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Holger. I think we have one more uh, slide for you to read here. Survey highlights. Holger, are you with us? Yeah, I just went through the highlights. I think we're ready for the, okay, great. For the poll. Let's go to that next slide then. Poll number one, how frequently do you analyze marketing data? And you see the answers on your right side of the screen now. Please pick one of those answers. We routinely gain insight from analytics. We occasionally gain insight from analytics. We rarely turn to analytics for insight. We do not use or have access to analytics or other or you're not sure. Please click one of those five choices and hit the submit button on the bottom right corner of your screen. We'll hold that for just a few more seconds while you're recording your vo votes. And Holger, any guesses as to where we're gonna, which is gonna be the winning answer here? That is a good question. So. 
if history or in this case our survey and report is any guide, I would say that the majority of our audience will fall into the routinely gaining insights from analytics, you know, category. So the A column, I think, will will win this one, um, followed probably by occasionally gaining insight. I think uh, I'm curious. Yeah, I think, might be. I think I lean towards B. I think we're going to be closing our poll pretty quickly here. It has ended, and we have our results. Looks like uh, the leading answer is. A, you are correct, sir. We routinely gain insight from analytics, followed by B, we occasionally gain insight from analytics. So that's great to know. That gives us an idea that half our audience is uh, using analytics now, and we'll go on with the presentation. Holger, back to you. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Now, here is some you know, more detail on the key benefits that marketers derive from marketing analytics. And again, it's all about understanding what tactics platforms and channels at the most value and, and it's all about prioritizing marketing focus accordingly. Now gaining actionable insights and acting on it to improve marketing performance is by far the most important business objectives for all marketers, regardless of marketing analytics, you know, maturity. If you look here we have basically two data series. Uh, one is for marketers who routinely gain insight from analytics. So the folks that just answered uh, the A column in the audience poll. And um, the other one is marketers who occasionally or rarely uh, gain insight. And uh, it's interesting that the results uh, differ a little bit between those groups. Interestingly, gaining better visibility into the sales funnel is less important for marketers who rarely use analytics compared to marketers who use it routinely. Right? And also when it comes to measuring marketing attribution across channels, this is much more important to routine users, 40% here, compared to organizations that rarely use marketing analytics. Only 26% find it important. Well, quite interesting. And um, yeah, let's take a closer look at some challenges with marketing analytics. Not surprisingly, the key challenges around marketing analytics it also differ significant, significantly um, depending on company size. Right? For larger organizations, uh, those with more than 1,000 employees, the lack of systems integration and issues with data quality and integrity uh, top the list, right? So those organizations have all the tools in the world. Now making them work together and making sense of all that uh, disparate data is, is, the, is a big challenge. For smaller organizations, on the other hand, those with you know, uh, less than 1,000 employees, um, lack of resources to execute marketing analytics. Uh, is, is the key challenge, 33%, and also the time required to collect and analyze that data. So um, again, based on your resource situation, right, your, your challenges uh, look very different. Now, um, take a quick look at, at money, and as we say, money talks. And that is why I think that investment expectations typically are a great uh, measure of the importance of marketing analytics within an organization. And according to our survey participants, marketing analytics budgets are expected to grow for almost half of the respondents. So that's very strong. And again, it seems like help is on the way for a lot of marketers uh, to build out your you know, marketing analytics capabilities. Let's take a look at technologies used for marketing analytics. The most popular marketing analytics technologies uh, are still you know, the traditional spreadsheets, uh, which might be interesting uh, to find out, but I think it's, it's not really surprising because spreadsheets at the end of the day are still very flexible. They're broadly available, easy to use. So that makes, uh, makes it easy to pull them in, uh, in your, into your tool set for analytics. Also interesting, I think, is the strong preference for cloud and SaaS-based tools, uh, with 33% of uh, answers here, over the uh, traditional on-premise install software, with only 13%. And I think that th this is likely due to, uh, you know, marketing having just better control over purchase and deployment uh, of cloud and SaaS applications without having to rely, you know, as much on internal IT resources for support and integration. And we know that this alone can be a can be a headache sometimes. Now uh, I think it's time for another audience poll, so I hand it over back to 
time. I think we want to look at uh, take a closer look at what you know marketing tactics uh, you guys actually track and analyze. Tom. Yes, we are, and the choices here are website, email marketing, social media marketing, PPC, display or banner advertising, SEO, content marketing, video marketing, and mobile marketing. So this is going to be the routinely track and analyze. I know some of you. Uh, probably do several of those things. Why don't you pick the top one in this category, click the submit button, and as soon as we get the, some more votes in, we'll, we'll tally the results. I want to encourage you to participate in this. Too many of you sat out on the first round. Let's get your vote in here. And we'll be ending our poll soon. Um, which is the top one for you, Holger? What do you think is going to come out on top? Yeah. Um, website. I would think so, yes. I think so many activities and, and, and marketing activities drive folks to the website for the next action for some uh, conversion. And it's to me, it's at the, at the core. They're all important, but uh, I don't want to bias the responses, by the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, website. Let's see if we're, uh, getting our results out. There they are now. The website is the winner with uh, 24 uh, votes. There. We have uh, email marketing next and then some of the other choices. No votes for uh, content, for, uh, I'm sorry, for video or mobile yet. I think that uh, shows a lack of maturity in those fields, but uh, I think we're gonna see, if we took this in another year, I think we'd see a different result. Holger, yeah. I'm gonna turn yeah. the control back over to you here. You can go on to your next slide. Excellent, thanks, Tom. Now, funny enough, uh, this slide almost maps at least very closely the results we just saw in the poll. Um, so this is exactly what our marketers uh, said earlier this year in the marketing analytics survey um, when we asked them, what are the key tactics right, that, that you focus on with your data collection, tracking, and marketing analytics? And according to the survey, again, the most tracked and analyzed marketing tactics are the website, 80%, email marketing, 77%, Basically reflecting how these tactics, you know, both dominate the marketing mix in terms of generating leads and engaging with prospects online, but also how they produce, you know, a wealth of data just sitting there waiting to be analyzed. And uh, Tom, as you mentioned earlier, I think it's noteworthy that otherwise uh, seemingly popular tactics such as video and mobile marketing still get very little attention when it comes to comes to marketing analytics. All right, let's drill down a little bit deeper and take a look at some of the specific metrics you know, marketers use to make all this data more actionable and um, yeah, for you to see a bit of a benchmark on how your efforts compare. We can see here that, uh, going back to website visits, that uh, visits and views are the most tracked website metrics, and partly because they're just so easy to capture. But um, I always wonder, do they really tell the whole, the whole story, right? And I'm surprised, for example, that conversion rates are only at the number five spot of website metrics. Let's look at email metrics. Open rate, 77%, and click-through rate, 73%, um, are the most commonly tracked email marketing metrics here. And same as with uh, website metrics, these are the most easily tracked and available uh, activity metrics, if you will, for email marketing. And conversion metrics and even click metrics uh, seem to take a little bit of a, of a backseat. Now let's look at uh, SEO. For SEO, it looks like keyword rankings, 56%, and sources of organic traffic, 52%, are the most tracked metrics for search engine optimization. Again, it looks like a pattern, <laughs> a pattern is emerging here with uh, conversion and, and, and results-related uh, metrics following behind. And finally, let's take a quick look at social media. Looks like social reach metrics are the most routinely tracked uh, metrics for social marketing, with 62%. And again, the more complicated the metric, the less likely it seems uh, that it's getting used. Things like share of voice for example. Now, um, this was a quick overview, and as you can see, there's a lot of data to capture and to digest to make sense of it all and you know, positively influence marketing success. 
You can find more details in the full marketing analytics uh, report that's available for download on the demand-based website. And I think uh, there'll be a link in the webinar follow-up email for you guys uh, so you have direct access to that report. Now, um, over to how companies you know, can make all this data actionable so you can get more out of your marketing programs and platforms and better prioritize your marketing. Amit, over to you. Thank you, Holger. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you may be. Um, just fascinating results from, uh, from the survey. And uh, the one that really caught my, my uh, attention was the fact that actionability from insights really is what marketers are, are asking for. And uh, you know what? I think that, that really um, distills analytics down. Uh, for the longest time, analytics uh, is con was confused with reporting. But really what analytics in, in the current times, and the, rightly so, is data-driven strategy. What we're really doing with analytics is helping data uh, give us insights to uh, to drive forward our strategy. And so what I wanted to do today was, uh, in the in the frame of B2B, talk about some of the differences that B2B has or, uh, from B2C, which require us to, to go through the insights in a different manner. Um, so the first part that I wanted to talk about was segmentation. Um, of course, Segmentation is an important part of the arsenal for, for every marketer. The, the, the better your segmentation, the better you can focus and target. The difference in B2B, however, is because of the way the buying cycle is in B2B, uh, the fact that there's group decision-making, uh, the fact that there's longer buying cycles, the fact that uh, buyers now, uh, and by the way, the graphic that you see on the page is, is um, a clip from a, a really fun video that we have on demandbase.com that describes how the current buying habits are in B2B. Uh, we call it the buyer 2.0 behavior. And so there's a fun video. What I'm going through is a boring version of that. But essentially, um, the current buyer, buyers, the buyer 2.0 in B2B, really um, it does a lot more research and they raise their hand much later in the buying cycle. And so what that means is that for a marketer in B2B, it's really important to focus at the account level. And when they're doing, when they're taking action at the account level, what that really basically means is that their segmentation is an account level based segmentation, and therefore the analytics also are are account based. And so that's one pillar that um, that marketers really need to to think through in B two B is what are my segments that I'm focusing on, and and which are the segments that sales is also focusing on. So therefore, there's complete alignment. And so for that to happen, you really need to think of account lists. Now, again, we talk to salespeople, they do this all the time. They have these account lists that they're, that they're going after. For perfect alignment between sales and marketing, marketing also needs to work off joint account lists. These account lists that the sales guys are going after are the account lists that drive your analytics and your action. And here's um, a framework that we advise our customers uh, when they're building a target account list. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire detail of all of this, but Broadly, there's a few things that you need to think about. First of all, development of an account list is not a marketing activity or a sales activity. It is a joint activity, uh, which involves sales, marketing, as well as business, product. Uh, whoever has a stake in the revenue pipeline needs to be part of the discussion about what, are our, what is our target account list that the entire company should be focusing on. Um, the way to get started is to think of your best customers. Your future prospects resemble your best customers, and that's the place you should start. Bring together your best customers, and these not necessarily are the most revenue-producing customers, but these essentially are customers that you want to do more business with, customers that get it, customers that are, have the, the largest lifetime value possible. Taking that down and drilling that down into attributes, so let's say uh, your best customers um, are in a particular industry. So you drill down into the industries that describe those customers, the revenue ranges that describe those customers. Are there certain technologies, certain solutions that they use? What are the different attributes that describe your best customers? And that becomes your starting point for building your account list. Once you have that attribute and attribute values together, the next stage you want to go through is prioritizing those um, in terms of is 
it more important that my customer be an enterprise customer as opposed to mid-market? Is it important that they're in a North America? Is it important? So it's basically taking all these attributes and prioritizing them. Uh, that sort of gives you the score on which you can rate your best account and then arrive at a list of accounts that really are going to be a focus in the current campaign season or in the, in the, in the current financial uh, year or whatever your planning horizon may be. <clears throat> and once you have that, what you now really have gone through is a process where uh, different stakeholders have, have agreed on the accounts that they're going to focus on. Sales is, has buy-in on these are the accounts they want to go after. Marketing, focusing their efforts only on those accounts, now is really supporting sales in their efforts. And when they're focusing, when you're focusing on these efforts, you're doing that based on the analytics. And finally, using analytics, then you analytics to really drive step-by-step -step improvement in your marketing performance. The, one of the key things that we, we saw in the survey results was the availability of data. Um, for you to really start progressing forward with account-based analytics, account-based marketing, uh, it's important that you make sure that your analytics has the ability or has that data that helps you focus up by accounts. Uh, so, for example, if you're looking at your website traffic, uh, you need to make sure that you have the right technology investments done to be able to get um, company-level, account-level data in, in your analytics. So, for example, uh, do you have the ability to identify which companies are coming to your site? Can you identify which industries they're from, which sub-industry they're from, which revenue range they're from? Uh-oh, looks like there's a fire drill uh, going on in my building. I've been told that uh, there's no danger, so don't worry. If the, the, the alarm keeps ringing, uh, I'm not in any danger, so I'll keep going. So, um, yeah, so basically in the analytics, you want to make sure if you're uh, looking, if you're a B2B marketer and you're focusing on account level segments, you need to have that data in there. Uh, so that you can um, analyze at that level. Also, you want to make sure that the data is available at the level that you can do ad hoc reporting. So it, it should not be available only in one region. It should percolate through the entire analytics platform. So now it, you have the ability to run ad hoc reporting if, if, if needed. Um, and what that gives you is through the account level segments, now you can really start to measure your web performance. Um, or channel performance or platform performance at that segment level. So you're not looking at aggregate data, but you're really drilling down into segments that matter for you, uh, companies that matter for you, and analyze how your marketing tactics that you're, 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 you're focusing on to, to really get results on, the, on those target accounts that you agreed with sales, how are they um, really moving the needle? And so for example, is when you're looking at content consumption, are you able to take action on that? Are you able to say, well, for um, the healthcare industry, are my pages for healthcare solutions really being consumed? Well, if not, what, should I, what change should I make to get more healthcare visitors engaged with my healthcare content? Right? So all of this um, analytics really is helping you drive action and helping you answer your questions uh, to help you drive forward your, your, your frameworks. Another pillar that's really important in addition to segments is now how you look at goals. Again, in B2B, goals need to be thought a little bit differently. <clears throat> because of the way the buying cycle is different in B2B with extended, extended decision making, with multiple stakeholders, um, and the, the role of content becomes really, really more important. Um, the objective really for B2B marketers is to be uh, playing the role of having conversation with the buyers as they're doing the research early on in the sales cycle. Um, and therefore, the goals are not going to be just transaction-based. Your goals are going to be a lot more about how am I moving the conversation forward. They're going to be a lot more about steps that my content is helping my buyers take. Um, and so you need to think of goals a little bit differently. Um, based on what action do you want your segments to take? What action do you want your buyers to take? Um, if you're thinking of your attract me metrics, so if you're trying to get traffic, uh, you're trying to get your buyers to your website, then the goals you set up will be different. Uh, when you're thinking of converting them, converting buyers 
uh, having hand raises, having form fills, uh, or a download, um, there are going to be different goals. And, and so the goals, thinking through the goals in line with what the business objectives are becomes a very, very important factor in setting up your analytics for action. Um, same way for if, you know, you're thinking of buyers in the, in the sort of the middle part of the buying cycle, then engagement is really the, the objective that you have for them. Uh, you want them to view more content. You want them to stay more engaged. And so therefore, at that, for those pieces, the goals that you need to think of are about um, page view. Are, am I getting more page views from the right segments for the right content? Um, am I getting more downloads? Am I getting more visits per search? And so uh, that becomes a second pillar um, that uh, needs to be, has to be factored in in your framework for um, analytics and B2B. So to put that together, really, um, the three pillars that really um, are essential for, uh, for you to run analytics and B2B are the visitor segment, we talked about that, um, the goals, we talked about that, and combining these with, with the content that your, uh, your content creators are uh, creating on your website. Where these pillars overlap is really where the magic happens. So um, when you're looking at segments engaging or segments consuming content, that's where you know your engagement metrics, engagement goals uh, can be set up. When you're looking at segments um, completing goals, that's where your conversion metrics are, set in, uh, are coming in. And the combination of these three are really where you really want all your objectives to, to uh, lead to. Your segments of engaging content and completing your goals that you've set up. Um, so essentially, the analytics then becomes a, a, a matter of experiments, of taking small steps, and then analyzing uh, whether your hypotheses or your experiment really uh, worked or not. And therefore, um, action and analytics are so interwoven together, it's not one without the other. It's basically, you take action, you analyze whether your hypothesis for that action worked out or not, and then make, keep making changes. So it's small steps, multiple small, small steps that you keep um, going forward with. So what I'm going to do now is go through some examples of some reports and just talk about how just looking at the data spurs action on the kind of questions that, uh, that you think of or the questions you need to think of to really drive action. So um, this is a report that um, um, you, know, you can get from any uh, web analytics system. <clears throat> uh, the difference, however, is that we, this report is now presented in the light of B2B. So you take a look at inbound traffic, traffic sources by a channel. Uh, you're looking at organic, direct, paid, uh, referral. At the aggregate level, you would take a look at this report and draw some conclusions. However, in B2B, you now need to take a look at what are these channels doing for the traffic that really matters. And so organic seems to be getting a lot of traffic from companies, which is great. On the other hand, your paid, um, paid traffic, your paid uh, uh, your PPC, your CPC, your ads, they seem to have a higher component of non-company versus company traffic. And so uh, um, you need to take a look back at how should you change your inbound uh, strategy? Do you need to uh, change the way your, your paid um, campaigns are set up? Very likely you need to do that. Um, on the other hand, with organic, while um, you have a good component coming from companies, but it's still is that the non-company traffic is higher than company traffic. So therefore, um, you need to build on the keywords that are leading to, orga leading to company traffic from organic and, and continue working with those, and then change the keywords that are leading to non-company traffic and, and try to start then setting experiments to see, well, what changes in keywords help us drive more company traffic coming in. So all of that spurring action really. Another example is looking at an in engagement report. So um, this report shows engagement across three different sections of my website. But when you put in the segment information in, now I start to draw out conclusions and, and uh, drive strategy and actions. 
So the first thing, for example, I noticed is that in the energy sector, for example, the services area is really, really a popular one. So in the energy um, segment, energy industry, uh, visitors really want to consume my services content. So that's great. And therefore, uh, what can I do to improve the consumption of services content? Can I have more services content for the energy sector? Can I make that more prominent when an energy visitor visits my site? Um, on the other hand, law firms seem to favor the solutions uh, pages. And therefore, well, what can I do to um, continue to engage um, law firms through my solutions pages? And then what action can I take to convert them? On the other hand, law firms really don't consume services. Now, why is that? Is that because I don't have services content for law firms? Um, or is it a nature of the, uh, the relationship that law firms really will not consume service? If that's latter, then it's fine. But if it's the former that I don't have service of content, that, build, that helps me build a business case with content creators, and, and we can really try to get more services content out for law firms and make that and promote that more for the law firms. Right? So again, uh, this report by itself uh, helps us really drive action by, by asking those questions and then really think through what needs to change um, so that we can then we can uh, optimize our, our experiences further. Finally, uh, in the conversion uh, uh, space, so I'm looking at uh, contact page conversion rate uh, by um, uh, company sizes. So companies that have less than 250 employees have a better conversion rate. So that's great. However, there's something happening with uh, mid-size, let's say, companies that have uh, between 250 and 500 employees. So why, what's happening there? Why am I not able to um, convert them? So what is the barrier to conversion? Um, over here, then, you know, we need to figure out, well, what do I need to do to optimize the last mile? So um, analytics really, um, when combined with these three pillars of um, uh, content segments and goals, really is the framework that will help you drive action forward, and analytics really becomes about actionability rather than, than about reports. Um, what I'd like to summarize with is um, some best practices for B2B web analytics. And we've covered a few of these. I just wanted to summarize the key points. Um, number one being you want to align measurement with business objectives. Um, it, it's very easy to get sucked into uh, data and reports, but analytics is not an answer looking for a problem. We need to start with what is it that we're trying to achieve and walk back from there, um, get back from there, and then try to figure out the questions that need to be answered and then figure out what we need to put together to answer those questions uh, through analytics. Secondly, um, and we talked about that a lot here, is you need to focus on, uh, or strategy needs, or sorry, analytics needs to help you with insights and action rather than just be the data and reporting uh, tool. Um, the, um, the investment that, that, that uh, companies are making into a lot of tools and data, it's, again, um, very easy to get sucked into that and then wait for all the data to come together. However, the bar to act should be a lot lower. You, you should be able to quickly start to do some experiments, make some small changes, make some small steps, and start seeing the impact those steps are having and then keep, uh, keep moving forward step by step. <clears throat> Thirdly, um, how we talked about the aggregate versus uh, segmented, really need to be able to slice and dice and bring it down to that uh, focus segment level to find the visitor and content insights. You need to be able to um, not optimize. You should not be optimizing for the average experience because, again, in B2B, every visitor is not the same. For you, a visitor from your target segment is way more valuable than someone uh, looking for a job or, 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 or just you know someone who landed on your website by mistake. So, um, the experience really should be optimized for your target segment, and the way to do that is really to segment um, down to the focus segment level and, and draw out the visitor and content insights. Um, the fourth one seems to be a, an obvious one, um, keeping an eye on data quality. Um, nothing hurts um, an analyst or um, uh, someone presenting uh, insights more than um, a lack of credibility when you know when when you're presenting to your business stakeholders and the first thing they ask is well how can we rely on this data I don't think I can trust it um, nothing discredits that more and so that's very important that the data that you're presenting there's a high data quality that's being used 
uh, to present the insights, and that builds that credibility and trust, and you're able to uh, really um, get the buy-in to, to build action within the company. And finally, um, analyst, analytic, analytics projects can be uh, uh, reports, but for them to be um, work backwards from the objective. And so let's take a look at what the business objective is. What is the hypothesis uh, that we are trying to test out? And then plan whether we have the right data, what kind of answers do we need, or what kind of uh, tests do we need to make. Configure, make sure that the data is there, and then analyze. Do that in in small steps. That really helps move things forward much much faster than uh, than just you know jumping a report and then waiting for action to happen. So I think that's um, pretty much it from my side. I think we are now ready for questions. Uh, Tom, I think uh, you can step back in now. Thank you, Amit. And I have to give you another award for uh, surviving the fire drill. Um, I've never heard a system tested that much, but it's good to know it works, <laughs> and it's good to know you're safe, my friend. Uh, I want to thank Holger and Amit for a really great presentation. I, I think the survey was very intriguing, and I think Amit answered a lot of the questions I had about the survey um, in his presentation, so that fit very well. Speaking of questions, it is time for your questions. It's time for you to get in the act. Please go to the Q&A window. I know everybody needs to know more about analytics these days and data. These, this is your chance to ask those questions, and we're going to get into that right now. We have about 20 minutes remaining in the program, so we have lots of time to take your questions. Please uh, ask us what's on your mind. It can be on just about anything. Our first question comes from Ron Greenberg. Share of voice used to be one of the key metrics to make case for budget. Why, besides being complex, do you think it is no longer a key measure? And are we now measuring mostly against ourselves? I'm not sure uh, about that last part, but that first part is interesting. Do you think, uh, first of all, do you think uh, SOV is, is no longer a key measure? Uh, either one of you can answer. Yes, yeah, it's Holger, just to, to jump in. Um, I, I do think it is still a key measure, um, but I think the observation is right that uh, it's competing with other measures. And the uh, survey uh, confirmed, which surprised me still a little bit, right, because it was 2014, uh, you think we're on to measuring all the complex and, and cool metrics, but instead it looks like we're still relying on a lot of the very basic uh, one-dimensional metrics to, to see how we're doing. And that's probably two part or one part due to uh, technology and ability to collect the data, and the other part is probably the sort of skill set in marketing departments, right, to, to make sense of more complex and derivative metrics. Tom? I think that's a good answer. You know, I was interested in the survey, as you were, about the lack of focus on conversions. Um, that really does seem to be the critical question in B2B marketing, so I'm I'm wondering why folks are not there, uh, whether they are lacking the tools, whether they're lacking the expertise, or, or what that factor is. But people are looking at your page views. That's nice. If they're not buying your product, that matters. So um, it, uh, the second part of this question, I'm not sure what Ron meant by are we now measuring against ourselves. Um, maybe we're measuring against our objectives more, and we need to do more of that, I would say. That is a good point, by the way, um, measuring against ourselves. Right? We look at how do our marketing tactics compare, like which produce the biggest bang for the buck, the most leads, the most conversions, the most opportunities, revenues, what have you, um, over time, right? Also how we're doing compared to a quarter or a year ago. But I think oftentimes we really look at ourselves and, and don't take into account what are sort of best practices in the industry, what are the best practices or the benchmarks, right, for conversion rates, for the cost per lead, for other metrics. And um, that's, I think that's, that, that's, that's important to always keep in mind. Not only am I improving, but how am I doing compared to everybody else out there? Great. Well, let's go on to our next question. This one comes from Carrie J. She asks, what tools do you use to track variables like company versus non-company and industry type? <clears throat> I mean, so, you want to uh, grab that one? Yes, I'll take that, Tom. Um, so um, 
there's there's multiple ways to do that. However, um, you know, demand base has has a solution that integrates into web analytics, and um, what that gives you is the ability to really track every visitor, um, even before they raise their hand. So right from the first visit onwards, the ability to really track at the company level, and then um, you know, multiple multiple attributes, but just those, like the ones we talked about for uh, countless creation, industry, sub-industry, revenue, and even first-party uh, categorization by buying stage. All of that is possible. Uh, and we have integrations with um, Google Analytics and and Omniture and Web Trends that that enable you to do that. Great. Michael Shea, and I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Uh, is asking how do you transition people from spreadsheets to BI tools, or is that a process that's going to be happening naturally as people take on new technologies? What, what's your thinking on that? I'd like to hear both of you on that. Um, yeah, I think it's really um, working backwards with the tool. I think whatever gives us that ability to put together the analysis. So I think um, the the benefits, of course, with spreadsheets are um, they have a much smaller ramp time. Uh, you're able to do your um, smaller analyses much more quickly, um, <clears throat> but the scale of uh, complex analyses that's required um, uh, at times can only be done by some play API tools. So it really is depend on, depends on the sophistication of analyses being required, and um, at some point uh, there is that transition over from stretches to BI, but then uh, for some smaller uh, analyses, spreadsheets are still going to be uh, possible. So I'm, I, I don't know if it's a, a clear answer, but I think basically what I'm saying is it really is driven by the needs of the analyses, and that's going to drive what tools you adopt. Holger, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I agree. So basically, in, in my mind, spreadsheets fill the gap that is not uh, covered right by the, the, the tools at hand, either because the tools don't provide that insight or there are no tools in place or whatever the reason. And in terms of transition, um, I also found uh, that there's interesting tools out there that let you keep using your spreadsheets and adding an analytics component on top of the spreadsheet uh, itself. Uh, solution. Before we go to our next question, I want to remind our listeners that uh, first of all, we'll be making a copy of the entire presentation and for the survey available through an email you'll receive in the next two days. Uh, there'll also be a link in there to a story summarizing today's presentation. So I hope you'll look for that in your inbox. Um, we still have time to take more questions, too. If you have a question you want to ask, pop it into the Q&A section. Our next question comes from David Rowe. Are analytics in the B2B world more or less advanced and what you would find in B to C? Hmm, great question, David. Amit, do you want to try that? Uh, yes, sure. I'll, I'll go for it first. So um, I don't think it's a question of more or less advanced. It's just different. Uh, and like we talked about, B to B is uh, the whole buying cycle is so different than in B to C. In B to C, volumes are more important, and therefore your uh, per visitor uh, metrics of, well, how many visitors are there, how many clicks are there, that is more important. In B2B, it's the quality of the traffic that's more important. So it's at the segment level that you need to start looking at, uh, at analyses. So um, it's just a matter of um, differently looking at it. I think for the longest time, we've uh, applied the B2C prism to, to B2B, and that, I guess, in the, in the absence of tools or frameworks earlier, that used to be the way we used to do it. Whatever B2C would do, we would apply the same principles in B2B. But I think as the evolution has happened, um, we realize now we have the capability, but also that we need to take a look at B2B from a B2B lens. Yeah, I, mean, I agree 100%. I think, I think you're right that uh, B2B is a different animal, right, from uh, consumer marketing. And the biggest difference, as you said, is the complexity of the B2B a buying process, right? There's many more people involved in buying organizations. Uh, the process takes longer, right? What can be a a few day or few hours of a decision making, or sometimes minutes in the consumer space, right? Um, made by one person often is in the B2B space uh, weeks, months, sometimes up to a year or more 
um, and involves so many people. And just the, the question of attribution, right, which is so central to measuring marketing success. You have prospects that touch uh, your company, your value proposition, your content multiple times throughout the year, right? You do webinars, you have online presence, you do social media, they may, might visit you at a trade show. And so, so those multiple touch points, you don't have that complexity on the consumer side, right? And that complexity just adds to, to the difficulty of making sense of the data and analyzing it. Right. Right. Uh, let's go to a question uh, from Will Rainbow. How does the trend towards personalization affect metrics and reporting? Hmm, that's a good question, too. There certainly is a lot more of that going on today, and the implementation or follow-up, I imagine, is, is the biggest difference in the long run. But um, how does that affect metrics and reporting? Are we seeing new tools, new techniques? Either one of you? Amit, mean, do you want to take this one? Sure, absolutely. So um, I think the, the thing with personalization is that it is making um, analytics almost integral to, to taking action. Um, personalization by itself um, can seem very sexy, but um, the ability to really have impactful personalization can only come through measuring the impact of the changes you're making. And so it goes back to that segment level. Uh, when you do personalization, what you're really basically saying is that I'd, I'm not going to have the average uh, one-size-fits-all experience for everyone. I'm going to have a different experience for different customer segments. Uh, how do I arrive at that seg segment experience? That is driven through um, measuring how that segment is interacting with my uh, platforms, with my channels and, and, and tactics. And so that starts giving me areas that I need to plug or areas that I need to different things in to engage that, that segment more. And that is being, uh, personalization is really a powerful tactic that's helping uh, really plug those gaps of uh, user experience at each segment. So um, the ability really uh, to drive the right personalization as to the right gap comes through the metrics and reporting. And we find that, you know, um, it, it's almost like an um, uh, interwoven rinse repeat cycle where you make a small personalization change, you go back and, and, uh, and, and measure the impact of that. You run A, B tests, you run two parallel tests of you know, personalization A, personalization B. The way you can really find a winner is through uh, metrics. And so the testing, targeting, and measuring, that's really the cycle that, that drives personalization forward. Very interesting. Yes, I think that's spot on, sir. Um, Oli Langer Wardock asks, the way things seem to be moving now is in the direction of real-time analytics and making rules and actions based directly on behavior rather than on rear mirror viewing. Is that right? And can you elaborate on that? So, Holger, uh, you want to try that? Yeah, Holger, yeah. go first. The first step, and uh, um, I think that goes back to the personalization question we, we just discussed, right? So in addition to sort of uh, buyer attributes, right, uh, you take into account uh, the, the buyer's behavior, right, as they're engaging with you, say, on your website. And so from, from that perspective, I think that's absolutely right, that, that uh, attributes are one thing um, and they're important, but behavior speaks volumes, right? Uh, and um, uh, intelligent systems, right, that can adapt to that behavior and present the right message, the right content, the right choices. To, to a, a buyer, I think, will will win out. Amit, what do you think? No, absolutely right. I think um, real-time analytics really becomes using data to drive action in real-time. And so, for example, personalization is, is a perfect example of that. What's happening with personalization is, in real-time, your web platform is making the decision to serve uh, content A to segment A versus a default experience to that segment. Um, and that's really what's happening. Of course, however, that does not mean that there's um, no uh, need for rear view mirroring, um, rear view uh, uh, mirror uh, kind of analytics. Uh, that is those those uh, longer term um, analytics are going to help you drive longer term strategies. So, as you, for example, take a look at uh, how has the experience been um, of uh, let's say, for example, we talked about going back over the last one month, um, my 
pages or the videos that I created for healthcare? How have they been consumed over the last um, one month? Uh, even though I personalize, I see that healthcare did not reach those pages. So what can I do to target those healthcare companies to come to those pages directly or make that healthcare content come up more prominently? That's something that at times with real time, you wouldn't be able to solve. So you'll have to go back into uh, longer uh, periods to really make some overall changes. And then those changes are going to help with your real time action. Does that make sense? Makes great sense. Uh, here's a good question. And I, I realize that we have a range of experience in our audience today. Lena Hallam asks, as a small young company with limited resources, what would be the best avenue for marketing analytics to use as a starting point? Um, I'm going to guess you're going to tell her Google Analytics is, the, is a good starting point, but have at it, either one of you. I was just going to say Google Analytics, absolutely. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's free, right? It's uh, very, very powerful. And that in combination with uh, spreadsheets, uh, just as the survey revealed, right, that's, that's still for most marketers their, their go-to tools. Uh, I mean, do you want to add to that? Oh, no, absolutely, right? I think the, the benefit of Google Analytics is the ease of access, the ease of uh, sort of use. Um, it, Google Analytics is accessible. You can make it accessible to many stakeholders within the organization. Uh, it does not require a lot of specialized training. Um, and also, of course, it's free, uh, and that helps a lot. But I think with newer changes that Google Analytics is bringing in with, uh, with their uh, universal version where you can actually bring in offline data as well. It really is helping. Um, I think there was another question about, well, what else can I use in Google Analytics? Um, so they have a solutions gallery where you can go and there's more plugins and add-ons that you can add. So really it can help you scale a lot. And, and Lena, I'll just add a personal tip here. If you haven't used the tutor tutorials that come with Google Analytics, check them out. They're pretty good. Um, they get a little confusing at times, but there's also support groups that can help you figure out. You can Google any term, of course, and um, get forward. But I, I think it can really help a small, young company uh, make the most of what resources you have. Going on to our next question from Wendy Leung. And before I do, I just want to remind folks that we're going to be giving our, our big giveaway worth uh, about $3,000, a ticket, a pass to a, a show in Chicago coming up at the end of this Q&A session, which will be in just a few minutes. In fact, uh, Wendy, this uh, may be our last or second to last question. Um, how often should analytics and data be viewed? For many companies, digital teams and marketing teams are separate entities, and analytics are provided only on a monthly or quarterly basis. Um, I think we are moving more towards a real-time world. Um, would either of you like to comment on that? Yes, of course. So. Um I think real time is one way of thinking about it. The other is really the analytics and, and data, um, especially with digital and content marketing teams, you need to think of it around projects. So it's really around that project that, uh, let's say a project for content creation. Um, the content creators are on one side and what you need to be able to do is really think of the objectives for that creation of content. And those objectives then can be measured. The impact or the, uh, the achievement of those objectives can be measured by uh, data and analytics. So once you have that conversation with the content team, um, then it's going to be a much more natural answer of, all right, so for this project, as soon as we put the content out, let's start taking a look at um, how, um, how our objectives being being achieved. Once the project is over, then you don't need any need to look at those analytics. Then you move on to your next project based on the learnings from this one. Right. I'm going to ask one quick final question to Holger. Um, this is from our friend Carrie J again. She, he, she noted that Holger mentioned looking into industry benchmarks uh, to analyze your own performance is a good idea. And she's wondering if you have any quick suggestions on where you can find reliable information for that. Uh, that is a great question. So there's a couple of uh, folks out there that that collect. Um, I think uh, Marketing Pros, if I'm not mistaken, has good resources on their website. Some of them might be uh, you might you have to pay for. Um, also, and uh, it's a shameless plug, but the B2B Technology Marketing Group on LinkedIn. Um, there's a lot of posts around that topic, and people uh, exchange their their experiences. So that's another and there's 
plenty of uh, marketing groups right across LinkedIn, so it doesn't have to be the specific one. Um, those would, the, would be the two things that uh, come to mind to find that to find that data, benchmarking data. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to end the Q&A session here. There is a LinkedIn group, I'm told, B2B Data-Driven Marketer Forum. That's B2B Data-Driven Marketer Forum. And we'll put the rest of the questions up there along with answers so we can uh, take care of all the folks who are kind enough to ask a question here. Um, it is now time. The big moment has arrived. Our big winner for the day, this is a $3,000 pass to the Market Research for Product Innovation event in Chicago 2014. The dates are September 29th to October 1st. And the winner is, drum roll, Will Rainbow. Will Rainbow, you are the winner. Please check in with our host to let us know that you are available to go to that show. In case you cannot, our backup winners for this will be John Fairley, H.J. Kim, and Sharon Welk. Please check in with our, uh, our hosts, and we'll take care of all that today. I want to uh, thank our guests today. This has just been a tremendous presentation by Holger and Amit. And the webinar has been recorded. We'll be doing a video and recap article, uh, sending that your way in a couple of days, along with a link to the survey itself. Um, I want to really extend thanks to Demandbase for sponsoring today's event. If your company has any interest in sponsoring a webinar, if you have information to share, please contact us at advertising at cmswire.com. I want to thank our technical crew today for their support. And for everybody in the audience who asked such great questions, and participate in our polls. Thank you very much for joining us today. For CMS Wire and Demandbase, this is Tom Murphy signing off.